4C Divers. Welcome to 4C Live. Thank you for tuning in. It is a great day today. It's Tuesday, November 24th, 2020. We have a great presentation planned for you tonight. Uh, a couple of things before we start. If you are tuned in, give us a hello and let us know where you're listening in from. We'd like to know. Also, if you're enjoying the presentation, give that thumbs up emoji, the smiley face, or the heart emoji. Let us know that you're enjoying this presentation. Also, in the comments section, if you have any questions for the guest presenter, you can go ahead and write them in there. If she doesn't answer them right away, that's okay. We're going to go ahead and answer them towards the end of the presentation. So, um, November, we have Thanksgiving, right? So. We definitely need to give thanks to things that we are thankful for. So we are thankful for the oceans. As divers, we love to be in it, and we love to see the animals and the corals and the creatures that are in it. So we need to do our part and learn more about what we can do, uh, not only at home, but also locally and globally to help our oceans. So uh, if you've been listening in onto the presentations this month, we've been talking about marine debris, we've been talking about toxic uh, chemicals that we put into the ocean, and tonight we're going to be talking about corals and what we can do to help save them. Uh, we have a great presentation, and I will get to who our guest presenter is in just a second, but if you want to make sure that you are in our live raffle at the end of the night, make sure you go to the 4C website and register. you got to go to www.force-e.com. Go to the tab events, find tonight's presentation, and you're going to want to register on the Eventbrite. That allows us to get your name and your uh, email address, and we put it into the random name picker, and tonight you will be a winner. Well, not all of you, but one of you will be a winner. <laughs> um, again, if you're tuning in, give us a hello. Let us know that you are here. Uh, looks like you have no sound. Hopefully it's just you, Gary, and not everybody else. <laughs> Anyways, um, okay, so some other things too. It is Thanksgiving this week, and everybody knows that the day after is Black Friday. So guys, make sure that you get your list ready because we have some great deals here at 4C Scuba Centers. Starting at 8 a.m., we are going to have great deals on all types of diving equipment, free diving equipment, anything you might need to be able to get in the water and go diving. So make sure that you get us on your list of stores that you're going to hit up and come by and see us and we'll get you a great deal on some gear. All right. Everyone says that they can hear us. So it must be you, Gary. <laughs> All right. So you guys, uh, you guys came here to uh, make sure that you're listening to what you can do about saving corals. So I'm going to introduce you to my guest presenter. I just met her uh, over the summer, and uh, I'm really excited about this presentation and the things that she has to talk about. Uh, so let's get ahead and introduce Ms. Shelby Thomas. Hi, Shelby. Hey, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Super excited to share some more today um, and really excited to talk about some corals as well. Um, well, we can just go straight into the presentation. I think that might be easier. So my name's Shelby Thomas. I'm the COO and Director of Research with the Ocean Rescue Alliance and A Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project. We are a marine conservation and restoration nonprofit organization that implements innovative techniques to restore our marine environments. You can go ahead to the next slide. Let's see. Oh, shift, there we go. <clears throat> All right. So. We predominantly work with incorporating artificial reefs that are designed to incorporate art, innovative designs, and safe materials to enhance marine habitat. So our target is to provide both fish habitat as well as an opportunity to outplant corals. Um, we have that ability to incorporate any kind of art, whether that's an individual sculpture, to really different artistic themed reefs, as well as memorial reefs. Um, each one of these reefs really help give back to the marine environment through both coral re restoration and providing fish habitat. Uh, we also have an education program, the Coral Rangers, where we're engaging our local communities in reef monitoring and coral restoration efforts. We really value getting all of our community and divers involved. So if you guys are ever interested in volunteering, we have a lot of different activities that any of you guys can help, whether you're coming out on a monitoring dive, helping out plant coral in the future, and um, a lot of other beach cleanups. You don't have to be a diver. There's lots of ways to get involved. So 
definitely contact us more in the future for that. Um, you can continue to the next si slide. <clears throat> So we incorporate um, conducting sustainable restoration through these objectives. We create um, artificial reef um, habitat as well as reef restoration throughout planting coral and providing fish habitat, provides an ecotourism opportunity for divers to come and also alleviate pressures off of natural reefs. We incorporate that citizen science and education component as well as really forming um, strategic partnerships and collaborations. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. We just started working with the Coral Restoration Foundation in Florida Keys, as well as the University of Miami and Seacor International as well to outplant coral. Uh, we really value research. So research is the basis of our organization. We use informed um, decisions to help modify our designs and make effective restoration progress. And if you can continue to the next slide. Thank you. So one of the ways that we are able to reach people is through art. Uh, we really value the ability of art to connect people. The ocean can be out of sight and out of mind for many. And so we really want to make the ocean a lot more personal for people. And this is one way we're able to do it. Um, our A Thousand Mermaids site is right off of Riviera Beach near West Palm Beach, Florida. And we actually just had a deployment last week of an additional 55 models. We currently have about 20 uh, mermaid sculptures down, which we intend to grow to a thousand uh, through years to come. But we also have other art initiatives that we're growing as well. Um, also last week, we just got back from Mexico where we're intending to put an artificial reef off of Tulum that will help connect Mayan culture. And we're intending to do a mind themed artificial reef of a dragon god. So we're really excited to really use art as this catalyst to bring people together in communities as well as incorporating history and cult culture. If you can uh, go to the next slide. <clears throat> Another way is we can incorporate uh, memorial and celebratory reefs. So instead of um, really being able to celebrate life and create a, a reef, eternal reef um, that helps support marine life and also outplant coral. As you can see in the image on the left, these are our mini habitat modules. And this is really exciting. Uh, we're actually able to outplant 10 to 20 corals at one time. And I'll go more into this innovative um, approach that we're using to be able to outplant corals more efficiently um, and in a timely manner. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so we'll start talking about the habitat base. So our reef modules are designed to mimic natural reefs. So we have these interstitial spaces of micro and macro habitats. As you can see in this picture, we have these smaller habitat shelf spaces that provide space for smaller fish species and life stages. So we really value that ability to get biodiverse, biodiverse fish um, recruited to these habitats to help provide supplement. And unfortunately, as, as reefs have been degrading, we have to have other habitat that can supplement um, those fish species. So, uh, if you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and before we jump into some more of the coral stuff, um, is for the sculptures, we have the ability to do 3D scanning. So we can take any image or person and actually 3D scan them and create them into a reef. And as you can see in this image, uh, this is Emily Gugliano, who's known as the American Mermaid. And she's uh, actually translated to that sculpture in the center of the, the screen. And she is our biggest mermaid sculpture to date. And that was actually deployed last week. So we're really excited to get out there and hopefully you guys can too, to see her reef module in the water. Uh, go ahead and next slide. <clears throat> These are some other varieties of artificial reef designs. We are taking a lot of different targeted approaches to incorporate different habitat types and monitoring those. So definitely need some of you divers if you're interested to help with some of our fish counts. We're looking to analyze biodiversity and what kind of fish recruitment. Um, in this middle left photo, you can actually see this is a swim through for divers. And I'll get into the coral lock a little bit later, but just remember if you can see these white um, placeholders all over these modules, these mini habitat modules will actually attach here and will give us the ability to outplant coral on each one of those positions. If you can go to the next slide. All right, the coral lock. So this is one of our really exciting um, technologies uh, created by reef cells. Uh, Chris O'Hare has been building artificial reefs for over 30 years and has implemented this technique of a threaded receiver frag plug, which enables us to just simply screw in fragmented corals onto our reef modules. In addition, these smaller 
mini habitat modules, as you see in this middle photo, that's a flower design, we can actually add these to natural reefs. So we have a threaded receiver at the bottom that can connect to either dead reef um, substrate or rocks. And we're able to just simply screw on the bigger module attachment. And we have a lot of different research that we're going into doing different designs for specific species. So for example, bring coral and different boulder corals are very important reef building species. They help build up the reef and make it more resilient over time. And unfortunately, our, especially the Florida Keys has been plagued with the stony tissue loss disease amongst other stressors that have just been really decimating coral all over the globe. And so one of the restoration strategies is to actually outplant individual coral pieces out onto the reefs. And we're really limited um, on our ability on how much coral we're able to outplant, as well as their ability to fuse and create a bigger coral that's able to reproduce. So one of the things we're trying to actually research is the ability to use these different designs, attach more fragments to where they can fuse and grow over these structures. And now we have a bigger reef colony that's more reproductive. Um, so we're really looking forward to this. We actually got uh, some corals out in the water this past week as well with the University of Miami. And we're gonna be outplanting with CRF here in the next few months. And those are mainly boulder coral species that we'll be outplanting. But we will be looking at staghorn as well as other species in the future. If you can continue on. And again, um, so we have the science, citizen science and education program. We really value getting our youth involved and providing opportunities to engage the local community. Really anyone can help. You don't have to just care about the ocean or even be a diver to be able to get involved. So certainly contact us. We have a lot of different workshops, beach cleanups, reef monitoring efforts, and a lot more. Uh, continue. <clears throat> Let's see. And again, this is the, the Coral Rangers program. So you can actually see uh, Stacy Brown, our director of education, uh, has led and gone into multiple middle and high schools to teach about marine conservation. And we're really expanding our programs, actually got 10 uh, young divers certified and they're gonna be coming out and helping monitor with us very soon and teaching about coral restoration as well. So we're really getting that hands-on approach uh, from anyone that's involved. Okay, if you can go to the next slide, thanks. <clears throat> and so some of our research expands again on fish recruitment and population dynamics. We really value that ability to target biodiverse fish species and actually provide habitat that's beneficial. So although the sculptures are a, a really good draw for divers and it's very unique, we also have that biologically important component of our modules. The coral lock gives us the ability to outplant coral where corals haven't ever been before and also outplant coral on our artificial reef designs to be able to reproduce more corals as well. Um, <clears throat> we're also doing different coral settlement studies. So we have different substrates we're testing. We actually do a calcium carbonate blast and calcium carbonate is what coral skeletons are made out of. And they typically have chemical sensors that help them recruit to natural reefs. So we're, we're testing different surface materials to help that recruitment process from natural spawnings. So that calcium carbonate blast is intended to hopefully target baby coral species. And we're working on with the Florida Aquarium, UM, as well as the University of Florida and the Coral Restoration Foundation to test out some of these other substrates to induce recruitment. Uh, again, we're also testing the different module varieties and designs and really looking to, forward to doing some more of these studies in the future. Uh, if you could continue to the next slide. So some of the ORA projects currently, uh, some of you may be familiar with some of these reefs. The Andrew Red Harris Reef, A Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef, which is off Palm Beach, Phil Foster Park, the Snorkel Trail, Pita Island, and um, several others Chris has worked with. Uh, if you're familiar with Blue Heron Bridge, he's built a few modules there as well. And we have some exciting news. We're actually gonna be building a reef in Dania Beach that will be coming in 2021. And we're currently working to get permit a few uh, near shore sites for snorkeling. So we're hoping to get on the East Coast a few of those sites uh, permitted, at least for 2022. And we're looking at another site over on the West Coast of Florida near Hernando and Pasco County to get a near shore site as well. So look forward to actually having some near shore sites that people can easily snorkel out to and, and really be able to help monitor um, in a more efficient way can go to the next slide. So the Thousand Mermaids Artificial Reef Project, these are some images. We actually have a selfie tail underwater. So yes, go take a picture and tag us and 
Um, come check out all the modules that we have down there. Uh, go, if you could go to the next slide. <clears throat> and this Thousand Mermaids site, again, is all of, our, all of our sites intend to help create habitat enhancement, as well as being able to outplant coral in the future, provide an ecotourism op opportunity, as well as different engagement opportunities. If you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So these are some of our um, artificial reefs actually after nine months post deployment. You can actually see a lot of different encrusting growth. These are actually encrusting sponges on the mermaid on the right and the left. You can see a little trigger fish in the middle. And we've seen a lot of significant growth, which was really good signs. These are some of the early pioneering species that colonize on the artificial reef substrate and help enable that process to start getting corals recruited. And we were really fortunate, just found out we're gonna be able to outplant coral on this site in the next six months using Corals of Opportunity. Um, we're partnering with uh, Broward County on a special activities license to be able to outplant some coral here as well. If you can go to the next slide. And again, so some of those artificial reef benefits is really that the ecotourism draw is, is great for communities because it it's, it's giving um, back to the economy and really helping scale up and bringing people off natural reefs as a immediate more relief from natural reefs and diving. Um, but it also helps create an additional habitat. So as much habitat as we can get out, the better. And it helps us be able to provide more habitat for different species, as well as potentially providing coastal protection. So we're actually designing artificial reef modules that we're hoping to do different wave analyses to reduce and use as a storm buffer. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, these were some of our um, different press releases with travel and leisure. And uh, we were really fortunate to kind of get picked up by a few different people um, with the press and get, getting some word out there. So the more that you guys can spread, the, the better. We're really looking to grow the reefs anywhere um, throughout the world. We actually are working on a few of our first international reefs, which include Mexico and Barbuda, and we're hoping to hear back from them soon. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Thanks. And so partnerships in the Alliance, um, these are some of our partners. We work with a lot of different institutions, universities, different companies as well. Seagrest is actually a fish distributor, and we're working with them to potentially create a reef um, that will help target particular fish species. Um, Seacor does a lot of different research and Reef Cells is our reef builder. The Reef Institute's actually an educational institution and we're, we're looking to open up to any kind of partnerships to engage and really expanding our, our organization and helping connect um, and incorporate collaboration to work towards the same goals. Okay, and you um, can go ahead to the next slide. This is um, our team, Evan Snow, our director, our executive director and Stacy Brown, our CFO. Chris O'Hare is our reef builder. And I think that's it. Um, <clears throat> I'd be happy to show, show some pictures of the corals on the coral lock if uh, you can bring it up, Nicole. I couldn't share it on my end, I don't think. Oh, great, Stacy's on too. There we go, yeah. So as you can see in these images on the left, um, these actually were with the University of Miami. This is a coral lock frag plug. And so the really good benefit with using these frag plugs with the threaded receiver is we can simply screw them in and we're no longer using any epoxy or cement to put them to the reef. So it's, it's a lot more efficient to be able to just simply screw them in and also have the ability to remove them in the future if there's any issues with disease or any kind of translocation that might need to happen. I think that's, that's mostly what I wanted to share, but um, again, there's many ways that any of you guys can get involved. So please feel free to contact us. You can find our, e email me at shelby at a thousand mermaids.com or visit our websites at www.athousandmermaids.com as well as the ocean rescue alliance.org. And I'll take any questions you guys have. Let's see. Or if I, Nicole, can, can I, there we go. All right, so I actually shared the websites uh, links Great. comment sections for everybody so you can easily find those links. Um, and uh, Shelby, a couple of questions that um, have been coming in. Um, so you're talking about the corals and the planting, like uh, I know that there's already some planting going on um, down like in the Keys, like what's the collaboration you have with them? Yeah, so we, we just started looking at using those mini habitat modules as a method to outplant 
Uh, currently, CRF's been doing out planning for years as well as Moat and a lot of other marine institutions. And they predominantly go down and are, are gluing down corals one by one onto reef substrate. So we're looking to try to increase that efficiency to outplant more corals at one time. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's, with coral restoration, it's really a, a big, um, t it's time consuming and costs a lot of resources to do. And really we need everyone doing it. So the, our ability to outplant coral more quickly is really important. And so we're really hoping this will help generate a faster process and also give us the ability to outplant new areas. And so talking about that coral, um, I, I, I was just trying to figure out just with my coral background. Um, so like if you get corals from say the guys down in the Keys, can you outplant that in other places or you can't because of the genetics and the DNA? Yeah, no, so that, that's correct. Um, currently not able to do that. Translocation is, is not allowed as, if you, as you guys are familiar with the lionfish, this is a, a good example. Um, there's a fear of invasiveness. So we don't know how that coral species will act in a different area. Um, and that's, a, that's been um, really under talk for a long time in the science community, because once we've put something out there, you can't really do much to bring back, especially in the ocean. Um, there's an example of a genetic salvage pro uh, project with the Florida panther um, that, that at least is on land to where they're able to control a lot more factors. And in the ocean, we're unfortunately not able to. So um, currently you cannot do that. We're actually using localized species. So the corals that would be going on the Thousand Mermaids site would be from corals in the area, from either Port Everglades and mostly from reefs that they've either fallen off of, we're not taking from the natural reef. And so can you um, give us some examples of what is going on with the corals here in South Florida? Like with, when it comes to the disease and the bleaching, what is the, I mean, we, we as I understand that there is those two things, bleaching and disease, but like currently, what is the scientist seeing here um, and what is plaguing our corals and why is it wiping it out? Yeah, so stony tissue loss disease is a really big one and that really affects those foundational reef building species, this stony corals like boulder, pillar corals, brain corals. And that's where you can see this almost receding line where you'll see a leading edge and then you'll see bleached white coral on one side and then the tissue on the other. And unfortunately, this tissue just starts degrading. And there's been a lot of research going into seeing why that is, if it's a viral or bacterial component. And there's been a lot of really good studies at looking at actually treating that with um, antibiotics. And some has been successful, but there's a lot of um, kind of hold back with that because we're not wanting to put antibiotics out on all the corals. But it kind of comes to this point where we, we, we need to do something. And how are we going to ramp up our efforts? Um, one thing we're looking at to address um, some of this is actually hybridization. So I, I'm actually, I work with the Florida Aquarium and Project Coral. Um, I'm finishing my PhD with the University of Florida. They're looking at also looking at specific genes that are stress tolerant. So if we're able to actually breed corals from the same localized area that are more resilient, we can put out more corals over time that have that resiliency and hopefully that would be better. So there, there's a lot of different innovative ways that we're looking at addressing some of these issues, but you know, unfortunately, especially stony tissue loss disease, it's it's really rapid, and you can lose like whole colonies within a month um, of onset. So, it's it's definitely something as, from a diver community perspective. It's really helpful to if you ever see um, diseased coral or bleaching coral, and you're, you come to the site frequently to report it. There's a lot of um, if you've heard of reef. Uh, they have mainly fit, like fish monitoring, but there's a coral aspect where you can actually report different bleaching events and things like that. Yes, that actually is uh, the Bleach Watch Sea Fan. Yes. And uh, I'll make sure to write the, get that for you guys in just a second. Um, so so <laughs> talking about disease, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the... Um, the outflow of like our intercoastal waterways and like mm -hmm. that. So when you guys are trying to plan where you're going to deploy sites, do you figure out like how far away you're going to be from say one of those um, sewage pipes or maybe an intercoastal um, inlet um, mm -hmm. so that they'll have more success? Yeah, we, we certainly look at which sites are favorable from what we're allowed. We actually are granted um, sites from the county. So we don't have a lot of 
uh, ability to really cherry pick specific sites. We kind of are granted what we what we have and we can apply for a permit for a new zone. Uh, right now, we've been working with sites in, in the midwater range of like 45 to 50 feet, but we are looking to get some snorkel reefs. And we, we do, especially for areas where we're planning to outplant coral, it'll be an ideal um, spot with the correct conditions for those coral species. Awesome. And, um, you know, do you, who else do you guys coordinate when it comes to figuring out um, how to get these things implanted? Like, how do you get us as divers to help you implant them? Like, what's what's the, you know, protocol of getting citizen scientists to jump in there and help you guys with this stuff? Yeah, so it, we're just now starting to figure out how we're gonna coordinate our site off of Riviera Beach. Uh, but right now when we have joint partnerships like with the Coral Restoration Foundation, they actually have a program already in place that's so really easy to get divers involved for those types of projects because they already have that. Um, we're, we're still sorting out what we're gonna do off the Riviera Beach site. And so definitely I recommend people to stay tuned or in contact. We have a email list for divers that are wanting to get involved, whether that's monitoring or coral out planning. So we'll send out updates as that comes. But for any of the institutions we're involved with, like the University of Miami, uh, we can actually involve them directly through us or through their programs. Awesome. Uh, we have people who are asking, you know, what about um, plans on putting some off Fort Lauderdale Beach or maybe in Boynton Beach? But you kind of already answered it. It's kind of up to where you guys get zoned for. Mm -hmm. um, with the, well, the, well the, the main lack, um, for, we definitely want to get reefs out there and we are looking at Fort Lauderdale. Uh, main thing is funding. So we have plenty of sites that are permitted. We can put reefs all over the place and any county will certainly take a a free reef um, <laughs> if they can get one. It's just fundraising to be able to get the reef constructed and deployed. And deployments can be quite costly as well. So uh, we're working a lot of different campaigns to be able to put out more reefs. And one of those abilities is using the memorials and sculpture reefs because that actually helps as individual people um, donate. We can build up a very large reef site, um, whether that's even from a plaque to an individual um, module people can get their own reef or even companies. Awesome. I actually, uh, I've been on the Palm Beach or Riviera Beach uh, Thousand Mermaid uh, Reef, uh, but it was not since that deployment that you guys did last week. So <laughs> I'm excited to go down there and take a look. But when we were on there, um, one thing was really cool. You, you know, you showed the pictures of the, um, the encrusting corals or um, sponges really, mm -hmm. uh, but, we actually dropped down and we saw lots of other animals. We saw a big school of snook that was like like corralling around the mermaids. That was really neat. Uh, we saw a stingray out in the sand. Um, we did see a lionfish. Uh, one of the divers got it though, so that was oh, good. Oh, great. <laughs> um, but I mean, just the the biodiversity that's that's already there, and it's it hasn't been that long. It's it's amazing to see that. Uh, what else? Um, what other animals are you guys? Is there any animals you're trying to target to bring into these areas? Yeah. So right now we're we're testing out a lot. As you saw that one image of the different module design varieties, we're trying to see what kind of fish we recruit. Uh, typically, a lot of artificial reefs, you know, a lot of those have been like ships and a lot of bigger things that attract bigger fish like grouper and things like that, but not necessarily those small fish species. So that's one thing we're trying to target is juvenile fish and smaller fish species because that helps sustain fisheries. Um, and we do have some of those larger reef structures which will recruit bigger fish. So we'll, we're interested to see um, what we get. We haven't made any species specific um, designs for this particular site, but we have about 20 different varieties we'll be testing and seeing what recruits there. Awesome. And then I've also been out um, on the uh, snorkel trail at the Blue Heron Bridge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the stuff that's out there, it's more of the small juvenile fish that are out there. So that's really cool. But I have seen little lobsters underneath if you um, get up close and we've seen eels and some people have even seen sea turtles. So, um, you know, it's just it's really interesting to be able to see what, you know, is attracted to these modules. And mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be even cooler to, when you guys can deploy those uh, those little fragments. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And we, and we have a lot of um, interest in the future to do a few different series reefs. So we'd like to create a reef that's specific for coral restoration as well as some deeper sites that are either for fish aggregations or even fishing reefs. So we're trying to designate sites as well that can target different people, whether you're wanting to go fish and certain ones for specifically diving. 
So there's a lot of different directions where we're able to go and we're, we're really excited on as we expand. Um, this is a good question coming from Jessica. She wants to know, is there any negative environmental impact on placing artificial structures that used to be natural empty space? So um, <clears throat> the main concern about placing artificial structures is, will they move? Um, so one thing that we do to um, impact that, we actually do uh, wave impact studies as far as um, stabilization studies to make sure that they don't move and can sustain um, different weather events. So they're, they're actually permitted to do that. So, and also pr protect and buffer wave energy. Um, there's no negative in, um, impacts from just, they're all put on sandy bottom. So we're not putting them any kind, on any hard bottom or near any reefs. They actually have to be 200 feet at the minimum away from hard bottom habitat. So there's really nothing there. It's um, in the area typically as far as fish. So it really just, it's nice because it creates new habitat and fish come to it instantly. Um, so that, that's a great question though. So, and that brings up the point, I mean, artificial reefs, we're, we were used to seeing for a long time people putting down um, wrecks, you know, boats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, manpower and the money and the permitting that goes into putting a wreck down is you got to make sure that that thing's completely cleaned out, no oils or anything else that can contaminate the water. And then over time, these things like the rust and, and other things that it, mm -hmm. you know, puts out, um, can actually be a little bit harmful to maybe corals in the area. So, you know, using your guys's, um, you know, modules, you were not having to do that. So Gary has a question. He wants to know <laughs> roughly about how much does it take to, uh, you know, money wise, uh, to install a reef? So that, that'll that vary. Um, as far as it, if he's referring to the deployment, it depends on the size, um, can cost upwards from 20 to 45,000 just to deploy the reef itself. Um, our modules vary from uh, $2,000 to 15,000, depending on how complex they are. Um, each, each module is at least uh, eight feet by eight feet. Uh, we have different sizes. We have lower profile, mid and high as well. So there's a lot of different design varieties that all range, um, but each module, um, will will vary and the deployment will vary depending on how many modules we put out at one time. And he also had another good question. How do you guys anchor to the bottom? Yeah, so good good question. Uh, our current site in Riviera Beach is not uh, set up really to to anchor. We've been working with the county to install mooring buoys in the future um, for more as we've been building up the sites, we're hoping it'll become more of a dive attraction. and That'll give the divers and, and different people coming out on boats to an opportunity to anchor there. Awesome. Okay, somebody said, <laughs> if Bill Gates came out and wanted to build tens of square miles of artificial reefs, uh, would that be helpful, desirable, and how could we do that? A hundred percent. And it's definitely a telefriend, <laughs> telefriend and uh, if anyone anyone can contribute and that's the the biggest thing it, it's really nice because you don't have to care about the ocean to make an impact in this sense and you can also really bring in an artistic and a cultural perspective that can impact the local community and that's one thing we're really hoping to do here in florida is going to each of these other perspective counties and designing artificial reefs that um, as far as the art side that really connect to that local community and bring out that history uh, we're, we've had some communication with Port St. Lucie to, as well as near McDill here on the, the West Coast to do a veterans memorial reef where we'd actually sculpt different veterans and um, have them and different branches of the military as well. So we're, we're looking on hope, hopefully doing a lot of different, different reef ideas and anybody could be involved. Bill Gates would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's probably some other celebrities that are way more into the ocean that we could probably get involved. Right. Let's talk Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Leonardo, yeah, that's that's one of them we've been like, oh, maybe he'd be interested, but if anybody knows him. <laughs> Speaking about, um, you know, movies, Hollywood, documentaries. Is there any good documentaries that you guys can um, point us to that maybe we could watch that would give us a little bit more uh, about how to save corals. Yeah, um, definitely chasing coral is a really big one. A lot of people are familiar about it and really just brings light to the issues that are plaguing our reefs. Um, and one of the problems we've really found with people, there's been a lot of awareness that's been uh, brought about about corals dying, right? But not as much of solutions and things to do. 
So this is um, really exciting because we're, we're able to actually provide an, an opportunity for people to engage in whether they're gonna um, help with a mini habitat module that we'll be able to outplant 20 corals on. And they can actually have an immediate way to help or even come dive and outplant coral. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to help provide some of those solutions um, to actually engage people and, and do something about it. It's one thing to know, know about the issue, but how can we do something? Absolutely. And just uh, if you're watching and you didn't uh, get to a chance to watch our other Facebook lives that we did this uh, month, go back to our YouTube channel. And I actually posted those uh, Facebook lives on the YouTube channel. Um, we had one where we talked about toxic oceans, talking about the stuff that we use every day between sunscreens, our, um, our hair products, our lawn products. Um, anything you could think of that could go into our waterways and how that it's harming the reefs. And uh, there's some good alternative um, uh, materials that you can use. So you can watch that Facebook Live. And then we also had um, uh, about trash, uh, marine debris. Uh, we had the people from Oceana talking about what kind of ordinances about um, plastic bags and straws and styrofoam being banned in the state of Florida. So again, make sure you're going back through and figuring out, um, you know, what you can do, what you feel comfortable doing to contribute back to our oceans, especially during our Give Thanks to Your Oceans Month, because guys, we as divers, we want to see these corals, fish, turtles, as Sandra Edwards says, her nudibranchs. Uh, we want to make sure that, um, that we are able to see these things. And if we're not doing our part, then, you know, we're not going to see them. So... Uh, get out there, get the information, figure out how you can help out. Even small little things do measure uh, that do wonders on on helping the environment. And uh, also talking to your friends, maybe non divers that don't understand or realize, and telling them, hey, you know, just you know, try this for a month and see if you mm -hmm. can live without that plastic or that you know type of uh, you know soap or detergent that you're using and. And it, it just make us, uh, you know, a, a better community and hopefully save those corals in the end. So um, <laughs> Stacy no, says, no, you know, Bill Gates, let them know that he needs to reach out to the pro project. We, so. we do. We need the help. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> for sure. We have, we have plenty of sites available to um, put reefs out. We're just trying to fundraise to, to get some of them done. And to uh, answer Sandra's question really quick, I see Stacy made a comment to it. But the reefs are made out of a... a eco-friendly concrete. So our reef builder, Chris O'Hare, has been building artificial reefs for over 30 years. And he uses CSA concrete, which he actually has a hydration process that essentially gets any kind of leaching out. So they, they don't leach, they're pH neutral. And he also incorporates other natural minerals like basalt fibers and that calcium carbonate that we were talking about earlier to help induce recruitment as well. So we're, we're doing a lot of different material studies and we're all using um, bio, bio and eco-friendly materials. So um, as an alternative to other artificial reefs, just like you were saying, Nicole, um, a lot of things have been made out of metals and things like that, as well as other concrete that actually leaches over time. So we're really trying to limit any kind of environmental negative impacts from that. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to bring in my website into, here we go. All right, so guys, if you go to the 4C website and go to the event tab, you're going to see Give thanks to our Oceans Month, and you'll see in the little uh, verbiage there, if you're going out and diving, especially this week, it looks like starting after Wednesday, we're going to get some good diving in, some good, you know, uh, commerce sees, better visibility. So get out there, go diving, collect your trash, take a picture, post it on your social media, and tag 4C, and we'll give you either two air fills or one nitrox fill for tagging us and uh, we wanted to give thanks to you for doing your part. And so if you go onto that website as well, scroll it down and you see it says eco-friendly products, click onto there. This is our give thanks to our Oceans Month uh, landing page that we made that has um, a blog about what you can do um, and here are the five things that you could minimize. Um, read that blog, check out our uh, videos that are on here Get your reusable 4C bag when you shop with us. Uh, look at the sunscreen videos. Take one of our coral ecology courses with one of our dive instructors. And if you're buying stuff online, if you spend over $100, we'll get one of these OctoGirl silicone cups. So again, it's not a plastic cup. 
and it's reusable and you can use this and it's super cute and it's um, eco-friendly. And these are all the eco-friendly fun things that you can pick out during our Give Thanks to Your Oceans Month. So, all right, so you guys wanted to know about the raffle. Well, I have loaded all of your guys' names and emails and we are gonna be raffling off right now a $50 gift card to Floracy. So let's go ahead and find that name, that random name picker. There's everyone's names and emails. All right, I'm gonna click the button. Here we go. Da -da 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 and our winner is for the $50 gift card is Eddie McCormick. Eddie, Eddie, if you are listening, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Scream in the comment section that you're excited. <laughs> to where you go and um, pick up. I will email you and I will uh, ask you where you want to pick up that gift card or if you want, I can mail it to you if you're not here in the state or anywhere close to the store. Uh, sorry, Carlos, you had to have registered before seven. <laughs> so he asked where we could register. Um, so guys, again, thank you so much uh, for tuning in and we hope that you know you guys will get out there and help us save corals, help these organizations, go to their websites, learn more, do more, and let's go diving. Thank you, Shelby, yeah. so much for your beautiful presentation. We gladly uh, will take that to heart and we'll get out there and help you guys with your you know, monitoring. Awesome, thanks so much, Nicole. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact us. Awesome, all right, everybody have a great evening and happy Thanksgiving. Happy See Thanksgiving. Ya.